Hello everyone. My name is Shakti Prasad and I'm your host today. I'm the head of content at Bero and I run the Procurement Espresso magazine. I welcome you all to the third edition of Espresso Live event, an online thought leadership forum featuring procurement leaders and practitioners. Before I get started with the session, just a few housekeeping rules to be kept in mind. All the participants will be on listen-only mode for the entire duration of the webinar. We will take up the questions at the end of the presentation, but we would encourage our attendees to key in their questions anytime during the session. Please type them uh, into the question box given in your control panel. There could be a lag of a few seconds in between the transition of slides, uh, so please bear with us. If you have any difficulty in joining the webinar, please try to log back in or key in your queries in the Q&A box and we will try to help you. Now, I am happy to introduce Doug Carr, the Chief Procurement Officer of MTN Group Limited. Now, you, you all can see him on your screens. Back in February, uh, well, uh, it does feel like very long ago in this unusual year, I had interviewed Dirk for the cover page article that was published in Procurement Espresso magazine. My phone line got disconnected not once or twice, but three times during our conversation. And when I reconnected yet again after much delay, Dirk calmly told me that he will stay on the bridge till we are done with our conversation, no matter how many times the call gets disconnected. His calmness amidst such unpleasantness is a proof of his leadership skills. So thank you, Dirk. And he has assembled an excellent team to realize MTN's digital objectives. Let me now turn my focus to Andrew Soach, the suave operational head at MTN's procurement organization. Hope you all can see him on your screens. He is a change agent for digital transformation and has successfully delivered a number of procurement and supply chain transformation programs. He is the go to man when it comes to digital initiatives at MTN. And of course, a big thanks to him for coordinating with Bero to make this event a success. We also have with us, can you, can you hear me? Okay, uh, I just got a message that people can't hear me. Okay, we also, we, we also have with us Laila Kakar. Laila is a data scientist and a data analytics expert who plays a key role in implementing MTN's various digitalization projects. In fact, here is an uh, important milestone. I'm glad that this is the first time Espresso Live is hosting a woman speaker. A big cheer for her, please. I know you're all on mute, but this is an occasion to celebrate. Well, uh, I am done with my somewhat lengthy introductions, ladies and gentlemen, please bear with me. Like all of you, I'm also eager to know more about the two leading solutions that the team will showcase. Uh, number one, A assistant Jessica, and number two, the decision support application known as DSA. Uh, without further ado, I hand over the stage to Dirk and his team. Over to you, Andrew. Thank you very much, uh, Shakti. Thank you for the, uh, the kind introduction. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. It's, it's fantastic to be able to, uh, to host this webinar um, on behalf of, of MTN and our global sourcing and supply chain team uh, and, and Borough as well. Um, so if I can just take a, a minute to introduce you to, to MTN. Um, some of you from, who are perhaps not from the region will, will not be familiar with, uh, with MTN. If we could get to the next slide, please. Um, you may well have seen our logo on the, the South African rugby team. Uh, as you can imagine, as an Englishman in November 2019, when we lost uh, in the World Cup finals to South Africa, you, you can imagine uh, how difficult that was in, in the office that particular morning. Um, so my colleagues had a, a good laugh at my expense. Uh, but you will probably have seen uh, our, our logo on the, uh, on the football, on the rugby shirts. Um, we are Africa's leading telecom operator. Uh, we operate in 21 different markets uh, across the Middle East and, and Africa. Uh, we're actually the most admired African brand. 
Um, and we sit around the, the seventh largest mobile operator in the world based on, on the number of subscribers. Uh, we've added around, around 11 million subscribers in the first half of this year to take us up to 262 million uh, total subscribers. And um, not the topic of discussion for today, but we're, we're obviously continuing to transform ourselves into a, a, a digital operator. Uh, we're moving from the traditional voice-centric world into the world of mobile data, digital financial services. Uh, MTN now has its own messaging platform, AOBA. We have our own music platform, Music Time, and we provide access to financial services to over 38 million subscribers. Uh, we've recently achieved the milestone of 100 million active data users on our network. Um, if you think about from, from an emerging markets perspective, we are, we are perfectly placed for, for growth. Um, we're in a, a very populous region um, and, and the upsides of, of, of Africa are uh, phenomenal. So we have only, only growth ahead of us, which is fantastic and extremely exciting. Uh, next slide, please. So you're probably wondering where we sit within MTN. So myself and my colleagues are a part of the global sourcing and supply chain, which is known as GSSC. Uh, we're based in Dubai, so we're all sitting in our respective homes in, in Dubai. And, and we're the single sourcing and supply chain entity of MTN Group. So we handle all the global category strategies, all of the negotiations, as well as the supply chain and, and logistics elements of the group. Uh, we, we work with around 12 billion US dollars of, of spend on an annual basis. And we've delivered benefits to the group of around $2 billion in, in hard savings um, over the years. We carry our own P&L and, and we, we operate a centralized procurement and supply chain suite, which uh, all of our op operations are, are plugged into. We, we also contribute significantly to financial targets of, of the group, such as CapEx intensity, which is for those of you who are not finance orientated, is basically the amount of capital expenditure which is required in order to generate the revenue. So effectively, you're, you're doing a lot more with a lot less. Um, we also contribute to things like working capital targets, cash conversion cycles, days of payments outstanding, days of inventory outstanding, um, as some of our sort of key KPIs. Uh, we also manage to yield results from, from specific projects such as the circular economy, which is effectively a, a, an asset reuse program. Um, so if we take assets from our, our existing infrastructure and, and you know, if we, if we upgrade network equipment or something, then we have uh, an opportunity to reuse those within our, our existing organization. Uh, the past years have, have been spent carrying out a number of network refreshers, upgrading our network. Um, we're the number one MPS in, in 12 of our markets, and, and we contribute significantly to, to data revenue and growth. Uh, next slide, please. So um, you've probably seen, you know, in, in, in the news that, that a lot of industries have, have been hit significantly hard and, and telecoms industries, fortunately, has not been impacted in the same way that industries such as travel and entertainment have, have been impacted. Uh, but that being said, I, you know, I did want to talk a little bit about how we, we've been impacted um, because, you know, we, whilst everybody assumes that, that people are, are using the networks and therefore you generate more revenue and, and it's all rosy, that's not, not always the case. So, of course, we've, we've faced supply chain disruptions um, across the board and, and given the locations that we operate in, I mean, they're already difficult uh, operations that, 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 we, that we run. Um, we operate in areas of conflict, in remote regions, so any kind of supply chain disruption, um, it, it hits us doubly hard. It's not that we can just reach out to a, a, another local vendor and replace the supply chain. So whilst our markets are already difficult enough to serve under business as usual, the impact of the pandemic obviously hits us uh, incredibly hard. The, the actual lockdown in Africa has, has been extended across the board. So, you know, in a lot of our markets, there's still a, a very extended lockdown and, and people are not allowed out of their homes. Airports and ports still remain closed. So it's, uh, it's difficult times across the board. Um, we've we faced, obviously, an increase in, in traffic due to lockdown. And, and most people think that that's a, a, a great positive, but it also brings around a lot of challenges in, in terms of network surges. Uh, we obviously need to increase the capacity on our networks and that's not a permanent thing. So we need to go to our vendors and work on kind of um, short term increases in licenses and everything to, to, to allow our, our operations to run. And, and so it doesn't affect our, our customer base. Um, and then obviously scale back down, uh, you know, when the lockdowns uh, are, are, are loosened. Um, so it's not all uh, so easy for us. 
Uh, like, like many others, um, we also moved to, to work from home. Fortunately, we, we had Microsoft Teams set up. Um, we were able to, to quickly um, mobilize back to our homes and, and pretty much run everything as, as normal, which we were very pleased about. Um, we carry a, a limited number of spare parts. From an inventory perspective, uh, again, another challenge in terms of, of disruption to the supply chain, how do we keep the networks operational? So we've done an awful lot of work in terms of ensuring that we've got enough spare parts on the ground, a lot of forecasting data that came with that as well. Um, and, and one of the, the key challenges as well is that we were in the middle of, of implementing a new sourcing suite um, across all of our operations. So we had a grand plan of, of doing the training um, in country. All of that had to, to, to stop and uh, not stop, but, but we had to deliver that remotely. So we successfully delivered a number of different modules uh, of our new ERP system. Um, all done remotely, all of the training uh, and everything was delivered by a core team remotely. So very, very pleased that we were able to do that uh, remotely. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, many organizations have actually been forced into digi digitization and, and I've just put a slide up here of, of who led the digital transformation. You know, it's, in most cases in the past, it was the CEO or the CTO. And nowadays, you know, unfortunately, the, the driver of, uh, of digital transformation is COVID-19. And, and that's OK. As long as there's a catalyst to drive change, then, you know, it, it's completely OK. But as long as people have digitization on, on the radar and it's on the roadmap and it's planned, then it's okay. It doesn't matter what the uh, what the change agent is for it, as long as it happens. Um, we found that, that some organisations were sort of scrambling to download Zoom, others trying to figure out how to process invoices remotely, or even just perhaps put a signature on a on a purchase order. Um, and of course, we've been in in pretty much uncharted waters here. And there's quite a few buzzwords and, and phrases that that come with a pandemic. We've got the new normal. Um, which you know nobody had ever heard of the new normal before. We've got WFH, work from home, quarantines. Um, there, there's so many different buzzwords. Uh, next slide, please. And I, I've just put here a little bit of fun, but here's the evolution of the Google search for for the word unprecedented. So an unprecedented use of the word unprecedented. Um, you know, absolutely, we are facing um, a time in life that that none of us have ever seen before, um, and and in some cases, businesses will die, unfortunately. Um, some cases, businesses will thrive. Um, but it, it's important that we look at digitization as, as a route around or a route through this. And you know, with no further ado, I'd like to introduce you now to our, to our group executive and our, our global CPO, Dirk. Um, and he's ensured that we've not only be able to navigate this crisis, but actually master it. So I'll pass over to you now, Dirk. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. Next slide. And again, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to, uh, to the world. Uh, Record-breaking participants, amount of, of people uh, now in this live stream. Um, I'll have had a, a slide produced in, in fact, looking at the McKinsey advice during the COVID times, of course, um, on their sort of procurement expertise, what are they recommending? No doubt the supply chain resilience is part of this 2021, 2023, business plan of uh, procurement advice, but uh, I wanted to highlight uh, particularly also one of those success components uh, next to zero-based uh, budget planning and then the translation into value creation in a category plan. Um, of course, you, what you see a lot of is the agility aspect that comes in into play as well as the partnerships and uh, innovation. Usual things uh, that we as CPOs have already on board it, but uh, very prominent, of course, as well nowadays is digitization and as well the analytics, the data driven organization. And I think uh, that uh, we'll spend a few minutes now to say that we have started early. We were in a fortune position actually when COVID hit us, and uh, even the centralized setup that we have in our organization, we had an ERP refresh. Uh, we have the office tools and the ERP refresh. Sometimes it sounds you have tooling, but it's all in the cloud. And that enabled us actually to keep the lights on, on the supply chain, as well as on, on the sourcing side. Our productivity actually working from home, all staff during the lockdowns has increased. We have the metrics, uh, 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 of course, uh, as well. So there has been a, 
a bigger output. And uh, so far, we have mastered also outages of networks or breaks of uh, port uh, lockdowns uh, and breaks of supplies. But main part that I want to get out here is accelerating adaptation. And adaptation is uh, something which is, of course, transformation and change. And, and this change that we have forecasted, we take very serious. And you heard Andrew talking about the digital operator, that is the business strategy. Uh, and we have far succeeded uh, already in the business, in the business function with, of course, Team Music, of course, with an own uh, um, messaging platform, but also with 38 million of customers online active payments that are being executed with our application and also through our network across Africa in terms of online payment, becoming Africa's biggest bank in that respect of payments. Let's move on. Next slide. What I want to get across also on the procurement side is procurement in its discipline, its function, in its service to the organization, we is core change. We promote change. So when I'm already in a digital operation, right? When I'm already uh, 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 not making the comment, I need to catch up with the business. We need to be front running. Otherwise you're not that sort of change agent. And in that front running, of course, in our organization as well, we have taken data very serious. We want to make it first part of our decision making. So you will see a lot of uh, operators, a lot of companies talking about the digitization in doing automation, which is efficiency. You will see that in our racetrack as well. But we also thought about use cases and application to make data part of our decision making, much more than it was before. Digitalization, also one of those uh, uh, paradigmas that we uh, onboarded is it can't be expensive. So I'm not turning to a lot of boutique shops, management consultants in order to develop our tooling and to drive the data into our organization procurement and supply chain. Um, it has, of course, an efficiency gain on the one hand side in terms of saving money, but saving money also effectiveness in terms of making better decisions, more enhanced, uh, 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 enhanced decisions even for the future due to simula uh, simulations. What we don't want to do, we don't go back to normal. That is already the downsizing of our facilities. That's all already doing much more automation uh, 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 in terms of gaining the efficiency to work from home. And then we will see also in a, in a few deep dives what kind of decision-making tools we have come up in-house uh, developed. So next slide. I call this, and I see this rather uh, as a racetrack, and that's why the circle actually closes. We start again. It's almost the same circle when you relate to machine learning. What's digitization and, 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 and what you see here on, on the chart is, of course, something that we have developed now approximately 12 months down the road. Uh, we drop those, uh, let's say, releases or new tools almost on a 90-day basis. And, and, and it all started with changing my organization into a more data-driven culture. And in order to make this kind of digitization sustainable in my, org in my organization, it is very key that the people adopted adaptation on the floor of data-driven decision-making. We have created our own, uh, uh, let's say, academy for this. We're doing news flash. The news flash are automated uh, uh, as well. So it's a kind of adaptation bringing people, let's say also the old school in my world, into the new world. Um, and that's the major and the core piece of being successful uh, going forward. Efficiency as well, of course, we have introduced uh, uh, Jessica. You will learn more about Jessica later on in terms of manual processes, but it allowed us even in COVID, of course, bots, bots functionality. You have that under the catalog buying, you get it off the shelf, you have it in call centers. 
uh, uh, not really new, but what we have done even under COVID, we have solved problems when we introduced a new end-to-end -end ERP suite. When we had still manual processes to be filled, um, we have used the bots immediately in order to make that a more leaner process and an automated process. We will learn later on more about Jessica, of course. The other cornerstone uh, I reflect on is our boom system. Our boom system who gave discipline to our organization across even the footprint of our 21 operations gave discipline how data is being input, inputted into the system. So it's a structured data approach. Also, one of those deep dives uh, uh, that we have uh, uh, that we have later on. It's also contrasting uh, 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 a bit of agility. Uh, it's reflecting on agility because we are also monitoring our SLAs towards the business with that sort of tooling. You, hear, you heard in, in the world a lot about the data lakes. Uh, we are mentioning it because, uh, yes, we do have an ERP system end-to-end -end from demand planning to the trade engine in, in supply chain to e-sourcing suites and contract management, which has enabled us to work from home because it is based in the cloud. It's not heavy client-based. It's based in cloud. People are logging onto it. Starve is looking onto it, the vendors are looking onto it. But the data lake, of course, as a business intelligence foundation, we've also created. Then the visualization, of course, it was also one of those drops, how we are going to visualize the analytics and give more insights also to our business stakeholders and vendors. And then use cases that you will learn about is the decision support application. Also an in-house development of course, using the insights, using the analytics in order to make decisions maybe still under uncertainty, but the risk of uncertainty shrank. And with those simulations and the constant learning, we are already using the decision engine in negotiation live in negotiation for global tenders. And then I will summarize, of course, the last product that is under development, which is the procurement cockpit. We haven't gotten to a branding yet, uh, but we will also cover that in a later slide, what kind of elements are involved with the cockpit. And I hand over now to Lila to give us some insights into the various tools that I've just mentioned. Thank you very much. Thank you, Derek. Could you please go to the next slide? So I'm honored to be the first female speaker and I'm even more proud to introduce our female robot, which is the face for all of our uh, RPA initiatives. Dirk already mentioned her, Jessica. We haven't introduced her that long ago and she is our marketing face for everything that involves RPA and automation. So one of the few examples that initiatives that we have already launched and that she is in the front, forefront of is, for example, our weekly digital news flash. Dirk already mentioned that it's uh, extremely important that we change our culture into an analytics culture, that we make sure that everybody within our organization at least knows what's out there and what's possible with technology. They certainly do not have to be able to have the skill sets to develop the newest technologies, but whenever they encounter any issues or they see something that could be more efficient, they should be aware of the technologies that are out there to help them do their work more efficiently so that they could focus on the more strategic work. And the weekly digi digital news flash is helping them with this by making sure that they are up to date on the most cutting edge technologies and the newest solutions to the problems that are out there. Second thing is the robotic process automation and which is taking away all the manual work and the work that doesn't really add value so that they have time to spend on the really strategic adding value adding work. And Dirk also mentioned this uh, before in the previous slide when he was talking about the ERP solution that we introduced and how RPA helped them take away the manual work of it so that they could focus on actually doing the sourcing themselves. Another solution that we have introduced through Jessica is the chatbot. Probably all of you know uh, chatbots and probably have uh, talk to chatbots before. 
Jessica is using it to help everybody within our procurement organization to answer the most frequent uh, questions if it's based on the processes that are going on or on the newest systems and solutions that we have introduced, they do no longer have to go into PDFs and click on Control F to find their answers, but Jessica will give them on a real-time basis the answers that they need. And a really important part of making sure that we change the way that we work in a more innovation, innovative way and that we boost our digital skills is our future proof skills training. So based on the knowledge that they're having from all the digital news flash, we also want them to be able to actually move away from doing manual tasks and making sure that they automate their work too, that we have an audit trail of everything that's happening and that every decisions are more fact-based. Next slide, please. So I think nowadays it's no longer a question for most companies whether digitization is helpful or whether they should invest in it. It's also a question how, where do we start? Uh, especially during the crisis, it's clear that digitization is ad adding value to your company, but what is a good use case and how do I know where I should start? Um, I would like during this site to explain some of the things that we uh, were dealing with and that we found were good use cases to start up. First of all, we had a data collection problem, and I think this is a really relevant uh, issue that most companies are dealing with. We were receiving Excel documents through emails from different sources, and then as, as a result of that, we needed to make sure that that data was trustworthy, that it was actually smart data, and that we could use it to do some analysis on it and extract insights from it. However, before we could even reach that point, we needed to harmonize it, restructure it. We, had, we were dealing with different maturity levels, meaning that maybe the same field or the same data doesn't mean the same for our different sources. So we needed to communicate with them and go back and forth to do a sanity check on whether they provided us the data that we actually needed. And as soon as we got everything back, by spending a lot of time sending reminders, going through our emails itself, extracting it, putting it at one, uh, at one time, and making sure that we have an overview of, the, of all the data ourselves, before we could even then translate that data that was now trustworthy into insights, which was also a manual work, into PowerPoints, and then sending it out to our stakeholders, that data was no longer, or those insights were no longer relevant because time had passed and new data was already available. So how did we solve this problem? Next slide, please. We introduced Boom. Boom is our procure to pay P2P uh, cloud-based process automation tool where all our users could just log in from wherever they were on their mobile phone, on their uh, laptops, even use their phone, uh, use their voice when they were on the go to translate it into data to give us the data that we were looking for. And all the issues that I just mentioned before were solved because we no longer needed to worry about restructuring the data or reformatting the data because they were not able to insert the data if the data wasn't in the right structure. So harmonization was no longer an issue. Also, making sure that we send them reminders and that we reach out to them was also no longer something we ne needed to spend time on because that was automatically done by the application themselves. If they saw the data was missing, an alert would be sent to the user. And more importantly, we no longer needed to spend time translating the data into insights and then sending it out to the users because on a real-time basis, they could log into our dashboards and see the insights that they had put into the application themselves. So there was no longer needed that we needed to check whether the data was relevant or not, that they needed to reach out to us to even get those insights. Everything could be done by themselves by putting the data in, clicking on submit, going to the dashboards and seeing what insights it would give them. Next slide, please. 
This is one of our uh, applications that was built in-house on open source technology called the DSA, Decision Support Application. So what is this technology exactly? Uh, nowadays, a lot of buzzwords are used as machine learning and artificial intelligence, but the question is, is that actually really used once uh, to get the insights that we want? I could tell for DSA, we actually did use it. Uh, one of the modules, or there are several modules within DSA, and the three models that I'm going to discuss now are the price curve modeling, scenario analysis, and market share simulation. These are not standalone modules because every module interconnects with each other, and the user needs to go through each and every module in order to get the answers that they want. So let's start with the price curve modeling. Why is it so important to model, for example, the price curves? It's important to get an understanding of what has happened in the past and what kind of trends we are seeing. Dirk already mentioned it before. If you don't even know the basics of how usually uh, your curves would behave or how your vendors would behave, then it's really difficult to give a prediction that you're conf confident about during crisis times. So first you need to have your basics right. Those price curves models would give us a good understanding of what has happened in the past, what are outliers, what were our benchmarks internally and externally, and how do we think or estimate that the price curves will evolve, uh, evolve into the future. The second thing would then be our market share simulation. Most of the time when you take a decision or you want to go for a strategy, that's it. You just go for it. The market share simulation gives you the opportunity to dynamically test your um, decision or the path that you want to follow. It gives you, you can tell the, in, you can give the inputs to the simulation of what your decision will be, and it will give you an overview of, your Im, of the impact of the decision that you will take, not only on your, uh, not only on your business, but also more globally. What does this have? What kind of an impact does this have? And how do I want to change this? Also, you can reverse engineer it. Let's say you want to achieve a certain impact and you want to, uh, you have a strategy to go for a certain goal. What do I need to go to? What do I need to, which path do I need to follow to go there? So a scenario analysis is exactly that. We have used it, like also Dirk mentioned before, for our global tendering. You have millions of possibilities. How do you know which decision you should take and which option is the best one? You have a lot of requirements, surely, also, that you need to take into account. And you need to take into account how the vendors have behaved before, like I mentioned before, the price curves. All of this is coming together in the scenario analysis. It optimizes whatever you want it to optimize. So you have a clear obje uh, objective with certain requirements that you want to have. And where it goes now, I think most of you know that nowadays, um, game theory is a really important thing when it comes to negotiations. Your vendors are coming in with a really clear strategic approach that they want to have and their models uh, that they are using is also making sure that they get to that point. However, you shouldn't forget that a big input in their models is our behavior, like their behavior is a big input in ours. So how are we trying to achieve our goal or how can we make sure that they do what we want them to do by influencing their input? So a scenario analysis is exactly doing that. It gives us the input that we could show them or behave in a certain way that they would behave in the way that we want them to behave to get to that optimal point. So it's a lot of strategic thinking and it's like playing chess, but then automated by application. So I think all of this is coming together in our uh, procurement cockpit, and I will give it back to Dirk so he can explain how this all is coming together. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yes, thank you, Laila. Um, we, we branded it procurement cockpit and uh, we look at the plane. Of course, uh, we just also mentioned ERP packages. We, we talked about the, the global trade uh, engine. We talked about demand planning tools. We talked about uh, the e-sourcing suite, auctioning. 
um, and the contract management. Of course, those are for us the wings, the tires, the engines, right? They don't go away. But what we want to have in terms of the procurement cockpit uh, further developed is not just the visualization. We, we will take on board apps functionality that steers actually this plane. So the demand forecasting will be on board. We also look at the uh, planning uh, analysis and forecasting the internal benchmarks and external benchmark information that will be there to support us in, uh, in negotiation. The spend analytics, of course, is also a data input that uh, we are putting together into the cockpit. Procurement engineering, when you have target costings developed and you have tear downs and a bottom up costing approach, uh, what margin your vendor then entertains when you have your target costing um, uh, developed. The market share simulation, what kind of aspects in learning and simulating and providing, of course, behavior and data towards the vendor you want the market share to go uh, in your decision making of an award. Then the scenario analysis, as also described in, in strategic negotiation, is more an effectiveness. It's, it's evaluating, of course, on the one hand side, what kind of scenarios are really the ones that we desire and what kind of output we are going to give the vendors during a negotiation like the game theory in which they are basically also learning and providing an answer to in the next negotiation round. The price curve uh, modeling as well as interactive that is being supported by internal and external benchmarks uh, where we want the price curves as a forecast also to go over the years. Uh, uh, input for the category plans, and then is the whole machine learning and AI, the behavioral predictive analytics uh, that allows us to make those decisions in a more data-driven way. And the chatbot functionality uh, as well that drives our culture, as I summarized, also into our fields, into our opcos in terms of it's a now different new world it's an adaptation and uh, data is the new oxygen for us in procurement. And I think we are exact on time, Sakshish. Um, if I can call you back in terms of starting the Q&A. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Dirk. Thanks, Laila. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, thanks for your uh, insightful presentation. Uh, we have questions coming thick and fast. Um, Here's the first one. Uh, I asked this question because you have not explained where you get your data. That is the basis for your outcomes. Uh, so basically, the, the person wants to know how much of the data do you receive from your customers via surveys and how disruptive or what yield do you get from soliciting surveys? Looks like he wants to know more about how do you get data and where you place it. So this is from Thomas Rockwell and he's from the US. Andrew. Yeah, I can I can start with that one. Um, supplier surveys is, is is not something that we do as as a as a procurement uh, function directly to um, uh, from us to our stakeholders. Yes, um, we, we often um, do pulse surveys out to stakeholders. Um, in terms of the, the the data and the information that, that we're getting, um, Boom is is implemented uh, at a group level and at also at a, a local operations level. Um, so we're having um, direct data inputs from across the group from all of our different um, operations. Um, supplier um, information is coming in as well in in, in terms of uh, spend data. Um, all of that information is collected. And we're, we're running an analytics cloud, uh, a data lake basically, which is where all of our um, data is coming in, allows us to sort of cross pollinate and, um, and, and put all of the different data points together. Um, uh, Lila, anything else that I've missed in terms of the, the incoming data? No, I think the most important thing is that at least our data is coming to one data lake, like you mentioned, so that we have one source of truth, which most of the time causes trouble if you don't have it, because then you're talking about different data and about different numbers. So that was a really important thing for us to achieve, that at least we had one source of truth and we were talking about the same things. Yeah, if I may uh, just also add uh, for the person in the U.S., uh, we have also external benchmarking data 
Uh, so it's almost like a, a, you want to call it a Dow Jones or a, a Nice or a, a Reuters data feed, but we are buying, of course, also analytical data to put into uh, the data lake. Uh, we do have, of course, a lot of operational data coming as well in. So if you look at supply chain, the adherence to, to uh, SLAs is also in that same data uh, sync. Uh, if you look at cash conversion cycles, this is going to be also uh, entertained and stored. Um, uh, inventory levels, DIO, DPO is also in, in this uh, lake or even forwarding custodian customs clearing data, freight, uh, freight data. We have monitoring and probes uh, uh, that allow us to also get uh, stored. So many, many sources of uh, data. Teardowns are giving us, uh, of course, in procurement engineering, price point uh, data on subcomponents that is also helping us to develop the target costing uh, price as a, as a bottom-up approach. This is also data that we are storing. So multiple sources, those are also only examples. And of course, previous tenders, previous proposals, e-auctioning data, all that stuff is in the data lake in terms of behavior uh, modeling. Okay. Uh this, this is an interesting question from Yash Singh. He's based in South Africa. I'm sure this question, uh, you know, a lot of people would have had this question in their mind. Why have you built a lot of functionality in-house versus buying existing procurement platforms? Okay, uh, I'll take this. Um, it has to do, of course, cultural change as well. So even our, our business practice or job profiles need to alter. They need to be enhanced personally, as well as, of course, skills that you buy from the, from the market. I think when you take data and smart data uh, close to your heart, you want to own it, you want to understand it, you want to drive your own analytics, and we want it to be fast. It does not mean we have not bought uh, open source if, uh, or taken open source or bought, uh, uh, of course, uh, robotic uh, uh, apps. Um, those ha we have bought, but the customization, the intelligence that goes with that data, we want to keep uh, in house. We want to maintain in house, and it's also a skill set we 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 are uh, we are entertaining in our organization. So data scientists we do have in our organization, why why not? Because I think this is close to our heart. We don't want consultants. We want quick delivery and also change applied to those tools in, in an easy way. I hope that answers the question. Okay, uh, we have another good question from Pavel Sonen from Russia. How do you deal with a lack of knowledge about statistics, machine learning and predictive modeling in the team? Laila, over Very to you. Interesting. <laughs> Very interesting. Very interesting. Actually, we, we we just got off a, um, a an all hands meeting um, where Lala was taking the entire uh, GSSC team through some of the statistics modelling. So I'll pass over to her now. But very appropriate question. Literally just finished that, that meeting before this webinar. I think it's a really good question, and I think most of the time data scientists are struggling with this. Um, I think you should always keep in mind what the value is for your stakeholder itself. I do not think that going into the nitty gritty of how the algorithms exactly work or what kind of statistics you are using to get to those price curves is important, but it is of importance that you do tell them where their value lies in. You do need their business expertise to put into your models to get the best type of model that's out there. You do need them to tell you whether something is an outlier or not, because that's not just statistically, that's also based on their business knowledge of uh, the business itself. So I think as long as they do know and understand what the value is and how you came to that point and where their input is, import is of importance and why it is of importance, that's already a really big step in the right direction. And it could already add a lot of value. Okay. I hope that answers the question. 
Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Laila. So we have a question from India. Uh, Anton Apudanayagam. Laila, Doug, Andrew, commendable work. Can you spend some light on cross-functional engagement specific to buy-in of the concept and key points for a good change management? I can start with that one. Um, I think pr probably one of the the, the the biggest successes that that we've had in terms of change management and getting the message across is, uh, as as Dirk alluded to earlier, um, it, it's about the mindset. Um, but we you, you'll notice from the presentation that we brand everything. So Jessica's branded. The tools are all branded. They all have uh, logos, icons, names, and and that for me is, is one of the, the sort of the key elements that that we're delivering as, as gssc which works cross-functionally and and it, it gets people engaged they start to get interested um you know, you know people do not always understand what rpa is but they understand what jessica as the face of rpa is, is is doing and that she's there to support and take away the uh, the sort of the manual tasks so so for me it, it's all about the sort of the branding and 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 the message that you're delivering as a change agent to uh, to your stakeholders I Maybe mean, uh, go ahead, Laila. Andrew, yeah, is to add to that, for example, when we introduced Boom, instead of just reaching out to the users and telling them, do you encounter any issues or do you need to have an extra demo of how it works? We had one day of a walk-in clinic that they could just walk in whenever they wanted. There would be a dedicated person sitting there and he would sit next to you and take you through it and answer all your questions on spot. So I think initiatives like that would also help them feel more comfortable by changing their habits and maybe using tools now to do their work. I think one uh, one ingredient, of course, that is uh, that has not been mentioned so far, not in the presentation and uh, not by all the speakers now, um, but I think it's also a critical success factor. And the critical success factor is leading from the top. As long as I make sure that I use all those tools, as long as I bring the procurement cockpit onto the floor and I access it and use it, and I make my own decisions and evaluations on it, yeah, that drives also the appetite of change because no one wants to be left behind. No one wants to be in the old world versus the new world. I think that's also a cultural aspect for the transformation. Okay, uh, thank you, Dirk, Laila. Uh, th th this is a very interesting question, and I mean, sort of funny too. This is from Don Bonner from the United Kingdom. There seems like a lot of investments here to develop these tools. Has this been costly? Okay, may uh, maybe uh, um, I'll uh, I'll uh, cover this. Um, the move to the cloud in general and what I call the engines, the wings, and the tires of the plane uh, is, of course, a major transformation. We were, unfo uh, we were fortunate that, of course, across our uh, uh, footprint and also in the group, uh, the one ERP system uh, in the cloud is, is something uh, the company drives. Uh, but it gives us the foundation. And, and we were also fortunate that one of the business functionalities, of course, is from demand planning to the trade engine, to uh, e-sourcing, as well as to contract management in place. That's one of the, I would say, the, the biggest investment. All other things could be open source. All other things are entertaining, uh, entertaining internal resources, of course, on, on the project without any consultancy. Uh, bringing uh, in councils also sourcing and supply chain uh, together, but it's in-house uh, uh, in-house developed. I do not think that the rest, particularly when we go from efficiency and automation into effectiveness, is being the biggest investment. That's not the expensive part. Okay, uh, thanks, thanks, Doug. Um, this is a very philosophical question uh, from Netherlands. Uh, it's from Harold Kuipers. I hope I pronounced the name correctly. Apologies if I uh, mangled your surname, Harold. What is the 
higher purpose of digitalizing procurement? Um, first of all, I think it's a direct uh, benefit towards the business. So as I described the philosophy of the understanding of procurement, we are here as change agents. We are here in this digital operator telco environment to promote change, to help transformation also of the business. You can only do this not to be left behind to do the digitization, to adapt it quite early and to drive it with the business. That's, that's one part. And then I, I think uh, uh, we always do on a daily basis decisions under, uncer under uncertainty. And I think the, the quality now we have here is we still make it under uncertainty, but it's data driven. Yeah. And the corridor of risk that I'm in the entertaining is being minimized because of learnings, because of behavior modeling because of taking data from the past, but also forecasting, of course, data evolution uh, uh, in the future. And I think if I can bring this compute all together, we are making maybe better decisions. That's the ultimate goal, under less uncertainty, still under uncertainty. I don't take that away. If I can also just add to that, the, um, the the current sort of issues around the pandemic has obviously focused all eyes on the on the procurement and supply chain functions, and having that digitized approach, that that visibility of information, um, data at your fingertips, is a massive advantage. When all eyes are on you, you 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 want to provide answers, um, and and having um, a digitization roadmap, which is you know even partially delivered will help you to, to answer um, those questions. And, and when investors are looking at, at you for, um, for guidance, you're in a better place when you've got a digitized solution. Okay, uh, thanks, Doc, Andrew, again. Uh, so we have a question from Portugal, uh, Yannick Berg. Was there any change management needed uh, to changing the behavior uh, from procurement to step away from Excel files? Uh, but work with uh, reporting functionalities. So I think he is looking for, is there any change management program required for procurement to adopt uh, these digital uh, technologies and move away from known ways of working that is uh, spreadsheets? I think I, I, I give it to Andrew. He, uh, he is definitely volunteers to talk about this transformation it is in in his domain he delivers on the on the projects and uh please enter i think uh it, it, it all depends on the maturity of the operation but but yes there is um elements of change um people always want to resort back to what they know and what they feel comfortable with and in any procurement organization you know you're going to have, have have young people who who really understand it have, have grown up with with new technologies and they adopt and adapt really well and then you're going to have the the, the sort of the older generation who, who who you know they simply don't adopt and adapt so easily and they always want to fall back on something which is which is comfortable um so so yes there's a certain amount of uh, of change required and again it's you know what Layla was saying about uh, about delivering the the, the values um, and, and making life simpler for people. You know, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of, of simplification. Um, and, and if I can make someone's life easier, you know, if they only have to um, input one field and then it auto populates, that for me is, is perfect because I'm making someone's life easier, I'm making them their, their more efficient. Um, but, but absolutely, there's, there's, there's a full change element around it. Um, people will always go, want to go back to, to Excel. Um, we, we constantly um, are driving for, for adoption of our, of our systems and our tools uh, across our footprint. Um, and we will always find, find resistance to, to those types of change. Um, but you know, the, the, the sort of the key elements around the branding, around educating people, the, the academy, um, they all help. And, and at the end of the day, the vast majority of people, they want an easy life. So if you can show them something which makes the, the day more efficient, 
you know, you're winning. If you overcomplicate things, you're fighting an uphill battle. And if I, if I may also, uh, uh, to be very honest to the community here on the stream, uh, it does not come overnight. That's one part. Maybe I can say it was a leapfrog jump to get to a different maturity nowadays. Uh, but but you still live with a legacy, and and I would say we are on a journey, and that journey is not completed, right? So uh, it is not just a tick in uh, in in the box. It is an evolution. It is a is a journey uh, that we are on in terms of providing constant change management and constant learning on 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 the data driven new data driven organization. I think that's um, that needs to be understood. And in Africa, we are a bit fortunate with the the workforce as well. I think uh, again something different maybe to the western world we are not heavy machine based in africa yeah we are not fixed line based we are mobile based in terms of how i'm collecting the data things that are normally at the end and being a point of sales mechanism point of sales system or uh, uh, only an, an ipad or only a, a smartphone device is quite common in Africa, instead of being heavy, uh, uh, screen, client-based in terms of IT architecture, that is also maybe a bit of an advantage that we see in emerging markets. That drives already the app thinking instead of the, the traditional ERP thinking and procurement. OK. Thanks, Noor. Uh, this we have a very interesting question from Laura Take. She's from the United Kingdom. Thinking about the volume of time it takes for our team to answer internal questions, I'm interested in the chatbot implemented in MDN. How have your internal stakeholders, that is the business partners, responded to the feature? Are they, res are they receptive to communicating with the robot? It's a, uh, it's a good one, uh, a very good one, of course, as as a mobile operator. I mean, we are promoting online services. We are promoting our own apps. We have an own messaging uh, platform that is a competition to WhatsApp. We have all local language, we have all local content, and even the, the, the music streaming platform that we have in-house developed. Uh, so I'm going back and saying, uh, we walk the talk, of course, in, in, uh, even as, as my business counterparts, my stakeholders, of course, they need to walk the talk. We're selling call center uh, uh, solutions with chatbots uh, out to our enterprise customers. Uh, we need to use it as well. So uh, 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 I think there we are in a fortunate position of adaptation that is quite maybe higher uh, or is higher than in, in other corporations. That's a fortune position, a pole position, um, and we are using that advantage. And of course, the biggest strategy is being a digital operator. Adaptation occurs. And the more that occurs on those handhelds and, and terminals, the better. Andrew, maybe. The, the procurement chatbot, you can, um, you can integrate with something like Microsoft Teams. So, um, if I want to ask a question about the procurement policy, I can just um, put in a, in a message um, in Microsoft Teams. So the user experience is, is pretty simple. It's just like messaging you or I. Okay. Uh, we are running out of time. Uh, we are, in fact, we are near the end of the hour. Are you okay to take one or two questions, Dirk? And sure. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Accepted. That's great. That's great. Uh, so another interesting question from Siam Fitvi uh, in the United States. How is the implementation of advanced data analytics improving the customer experience and streamlining internal processes? Laila, do you want to take the, uh, the question? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I think like Dirk mentioned in the beginning when we were talking about advanced analytics and mostly machine learning and AI, it's not a one-off project and then it's done. Uh, because 
you should keep on learning and the machine is obviously also keep on learning. So we are making sure that each time we look back to whatever is being predicted and we give our feedback back to the algorithms that, okay, this makes sense, this doesn't make sense. And as time passes, you also get more information in intelligence. So I think it's really important that the stakeholders and the users are also understanding that it's not just a one-off thing or a project that will end in X amount of time and then that's it. It's something you need to keep on catering to and you need to on, keep on looking back to it. And I think this also goes back to the question before, of why would you build something in-house? Exactly because of this. It's not just like a ERP installation that you just put into place and that's it. And then you can start to use it. Whenever we're talking about advanced analytics, it's a dynamic process that's ongoing because you want to improve it and you want it to learn from whatever has happened and is happening at the moment. Um, so I think that's a really important thing that that should be your mentality that it's not done in X amount of time. No, it should be a BAU. You should, should keep on going back to it and seeing if it's improving. And if it's not improving, then something is going wrong. So it should also have your intention. Um, yeah, I think, uh, so, yeah, go ahead, Andrew, so, uh, please. please. Um, I, I was going to say that, the, so in terms of in, in improving customer experience, um, there's, the, there's two sides to that. One is the, the sort of the experience of, of procurement teams themselves. Um, as I mentioned before, the sort of the, the automation side um, is taking away the, the, the manual tasks, but also something like, a, you know, auto-populating of, of fields, um, using RPA to, to transfer information from, from one file to another. Um, so you've got that sort of customer experience. I, I would class as, as sort of my internal uh, stakeholders within procurement. And then on the flip side, you've got the, the business stakeholders. And, and I guess uh, so the, the visualization that we're providing there um, within the Boom platform, um, the, the BI layer allows, uh, allows you to get insights into um, sourcing requests that uh, that you that you've placed, um, so you can see where they are in the in the chain um, or within the workflow. Um, and then in terms of um, of streamlining internal processes, of course, the the data that we're we're gathering, um, we're actually using to drive process change. So you know it points us to specific areas within a process where there may be a bottleneck. Um, and that allows us to then work on that particular particular process. Um, I think that the, the one sort of final thing that I just add there in terms of again kind of customer experience, but it's it's more about efficiencies and um, and driving additional savings is is the analytics that we're we're bringing now. You know, we're combining things like uh, spend savings and looking back historically and 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 forecasting as well to say within a specific area, I know if I spend X amount of money, I should deliver Y savings. Um, and, and if I'm within a certain threshold of that, or you know, if I'm 20% below that, I know that I can target that particular area and say, okay, is there a problem there? I should be, if, I'm, if my business is spending this much, then I should generate X amount of savings from that. So it allows them to drill down into specific areas of the business to try and generate additional savings. Thank you, Andrew. Maybe I, I'd, I'd just also add for, for the person in the US, that uh, stu uh, stipulated the question. Customer experience in terms of our internal stakeholders? Yes, been in the middle of it. I had a, a few global tenders where business stakeholders have called my organization out where I missed a scenario, a valid scenario that would fulfill all the criteria and business requirements. And I did it even together with the uh, with the business stakeholders. And the biggest surprise the, la the last time was due to our machine learning, due to our simulations, I, I was able towards the same business stakeholder to tell him the solution room, the universe of solutions that was in the beginning actually million uh, uh, million cases or, or, or uh, uh, variations that we set it and we were giving the result where we did not miss any of the valid scenarios. Um, so it, it downside and it dazzled him and you need to dazzle your uh, uh, stakeholders, of course. So that is also a prime example where we have enhanced with a negotiation tool, our customer experience, if you look at uh, uh, 
internal stakeholder. Okay, uh, thank you once again. Uh, this question is addressed to Lila. Uh, could uh, this is from Marnix Laws? He's from Netherlands. Uh, could Lila give an operational example or a best practice of market share simulation or scenario analysis? Uh, would it be possible, Lila, for you to give something top of the mind? Yeah, maybe Sorry, before Lila uh, starts. Before Lila starts, uh, uh, sh uh, yes, she can, of course. But uh, I, I just want to make maybe also uh, a clarification. PowerPoint is a very, it's paper-based. Yeah, it, It's a, a visualization. We would have loved, of course, on this platform to show you really a uh, decision-making with the application and simulate it. Uh, unfortunately, I, I think even with our partner, uh, uh, those massive registration would have brought with any thought of animation and live demo, the platform down. So uh, I think we need to apologize on, on, on that part. It was a visualization on PowerPoint. Of course, when we talk about apps, when we talk about tool, it's very dynamic. So over to you, Lila, for examples. So yeah, I think uh, Dirk already gave the best example that was out there when it comes to scenario analysis, where he was mentioning that we had a million options even more than millions of options, and we needed to narrow it down. Imagine if you would do that on Excel, you it wouldn't be possible. And then putting a solver onto Excel by actually optimizing it based on certain requirements that you had, it for sure would crash. That's the reason why we couldn't do it before, because it was too big of a problem. Uh, and by using our open source technology and moving to, uh, let's say, technology that is better able to handle big data, we were able to optimize it and to narrow down our solutions. And I think what Dirk also mentioned is it's really dynamic. So imagine before you would go into a negotiation, you needed to figure this all out before because it would take an immense amount of time to get those data points. Uh, and then you needed to put them into a PowerPoint to at least make them understandable and visualize them to the, your stakeholders. So when something happened in your negotiation and you needed to go back and spend again a lot of time and now this was done in split seconds on the spot during the negotiation itself. So I think this was the best use case that we had that we saved a lot of time and could actually focus on strategic, uh, more on the strategy instead of trying to get the numbers to decide what was the best strategy. And we were able. And we were able, of course, through that automation, through that machine learning of valid, so this is the, the use case, uh, tender scenarios, award scenarios. Yeah. So what would suit us the best on the potential uh, uh, permutations of this uh, tender of awards? What would suit us the best? But it helped us during the negotiation to show and guide the vendors with data points that they are modeling in order to respond to our requests. So we have influenced also the behavior with feedbacks during the negotiation out of the system inst instantaneously uh, uh, in order to drive a desired outcome in that negotiation. I hope that describes it from an example. Okay, Dirk, Laila, Andrew, we have really uh, overshot our time. Uh, can you take one final question? Uh, then we'll end it. Yes, yeah, sure. Okay, I, th I think this question is very apt uh, to end our session. Do you have any failures in your journey that you can share and how you would do it differently? This is from Maureen Main, uh, she's from Canada. Also a good question, yes. uh very good question um failures i don't think so i don't think we've i don't think we would i would say that we've um we've failed in anything that we we've, we've tried to do um things have taken longer um adoption hasn't always been as fast as we would like um but i don't think that we've had any sort of out and out 
failures as such. You know, with, with things like the chatbot, we would try multiple different routes. Um, one of the, the low coding platforms that, that we started to use, we had quite a bit of, um, let's say, issues at the start um, in terms of working with the developers as well as kind of helping hands. Um, but I mean, in, in that particular instance, I don't know, Lila, if you want to talk more about that, but it was something that we managed through. Um, it, it, we have a, we're blessed with a, with a very hardworking team who are, are very diligent and, and they make sure that, uh, that they deliver on, on whatever they say they're going to deliver. So yeah, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to say that we, I don't think we've had any out and out failures. Yeah, I would also definitely not call it failures, but I would call it roadblocks maybe. But that's why if you are working with uh, digital solutions, you need to have a really agile and dynamic approach. You cannot just stick to whatever you thought would be the best approach and then push it through, although you're seeing or you're facing roadblocks. So I think our team has been pretty agile in the way of trying to adopt whichever roadblock we were facing and then eventually if you face that roadblock and you're able to be agile and find a solution for it, it will not translate into a failure, but eventually it will be a success. But definitely roadblocks during uh, the whole journey. Um, but I think your approach is really important that you do understand that it, you should be really dynamic and you should try to find other ways by getting to the goal that you need. And maybe also to summarize in, in, in uh, making this not a secret in terms of also the question we had out of South Africa about COTS packages. We are using subcomponents that are open source or they are COTS packages. So uh, amongst them is Alteryx, uh, it's Soho, it's uh, Automation Anywhere. Uh, so various toolkits that we are putting together in order to support, let's say, the racetrack, as I said, that always is a next round the next day or the next 12 months uh, where we are maybe adding other codes packages or we are enhancing them. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Doug, Andrew, and Lila. That was a great session on how best to go about implementing digital solutions in a procurement organization. Yeah, we would have loved uh, you to demo uh, some of the uh, tools and solutions that you have built, but unfortunately, uh, the, you know, the platform really didn't allow us to do a live demo because of inherent uh, difficulties. Uh, we have received several more interesting questions, but unfortunately, we have run out of time. Uh, we will try and reply by email to all the questions that were not answered in today's sessions. We will try our best. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this marks the end of our session. A big thank you to all the participants for logging in today. And yes, we will be sharing the web webinar recording link with all our participants soon. We have been receiving several messages uh, regarding this. Yes, we will uh, share the recording with all of you soon. Uh, please do reach out to the email address on the screen uh, if you have any additional questions. Uh, that's it. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.